Okay, so let's start with the next session. I am too happy to present um, the next speaker, Professor Dr. Keita Ito. He received his doctorate in medical engineering and medical physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his medical degree in Harvard Medicine School. Currently, he is vice dean and full professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And he is also a professor in the Department of Orthopedics at the University Medical Center Utrecht, where he works in medical in mechanobiology of musculoskeletal regeneration medicine. So whenever you are ready. So thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks uh, for Jerome for inviting me to talk here. Um, I'm going to sort of switch gears uh, and talk to you about something else other than sort of regulation and startup companies and so. Uh, and I'm sorry, but I gave the wrong sort of title for my talk in the program. So what I'm going to talk today is about uh, patient-specific uh, spy models. And I'm using these models uh, not for diagnosis, not for decision making, but I'm actually trying to use them to understand a disease called adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, and I'm really interested in what causes this disease. And I'm going to use in silico modeling as one way of trying to investigate it. So let's see. Uh, but I'll start back a little bit more general. Uh, I don't know if you all realize, but orthopedics is actually a relatively new term. It describes the subspecialty or the specialty, uh, but it actually was coined only in the uh, 16th century, or let's say 18th century, by a guy named Nicolas Andri. And he came up with this word orthopedia as the art of correcting and preventing deformities in children. And orthopedia comes from orthos to straighten, and pedion from child. Okay? And actually, the symbol of orthopedics that some of you may have seen is this tree, which is called the Andri tree. And the idea is that by basically attaching it to something which is straight and pulling it to something straight, that you can straighten out the trunk of the tree. So this is what a scoliotic spine looks like. It's a curvature deformity, and as you can see, it has very similarities to that tree trunk. Uh, it actually is a very old disease. It was first described by Hippocrates uh, over 2,000 years ago, so 400 BC. And the modern disease is actually not much different than the disease Hippocrates described. Uh, and also, since the time of Hippocrates, there has been no effective treatment uh, to cure the disease. We have ways of handling it, but curing it is not still possible, which is quite amazing if you think the amount of time people have spent studying this disease. So what is ado uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis? Well, it actually is the most common form of scoliosis in our population. It's a 3D spine deformity, so we often just look at it on a plain x-ray looking from the front or the back, and we think of it as a side-to-side -side curvature. But it's actually a 3D deformity. Uh, it affects actually healthy children between the ages of about 10 and 18. Um, it's actually not very painful to the children, uh, and there are also no neurological symptoms that go with the deformity, even though you know that the spinal cord is inside that spinal column being all twisted and so. But it is a very disfiguring, or can be a very disfiguring uh, disease, and it also can create functional uh, disabilities. So if you have severe scoliosis, it can actually change the volume of your rib cage so much so that you would have difficulty breathing. Okay, never mind just moving around and doing your daily activities. And the amount or the severity of this disfiguring and the severity of the functional disabilities are directly proportional to the severity of the curvature or the deformity. Um, it's not a very prevalent disease. It only affects about 2 to 3% of the population. Uh, it's much more prevalent in girls than in boys. Uh, and it, it doesn't have a very high societal burden, and maybe that's one of the reasons why not many people study it, uh, simply because only 2 or 3% of the population suffer from it. But if you think of the sort of cost per patient uh, for a disease, it's relatively high. Um, 
The impact on the quality of life of these patients is very high. And there's also what we often don't think about is there's really a huge psychological sort of cost to the quality of life or the impact. And it's, it's because it's hitting uh, adolescents in a time when people are really vulnerable. They're trying to figure out who they are. And of course, if you have this disfigurement, it's going to really affect you psychologically. So the natural history of scoliosis is actually not a good one. It's a progressive deformity. Uh, so there are very few uh, deformities or curvatures that do not progress during the time of your adolescence. It is very patient-specific, uh, and it's dependent upon the amount of curvature you have and the skeletal age when the curvature is discovered. Now, the curvature is described by something called the Cobb's angle, and that's the angle that you see, I think, here, if I can use this pointer, right? So it's the angle that's between the highest or the vertebra that's closest to your head that's the most tilted, and then the vertebra down below closest to your hips, which is the most tilted, and then the angle between them is called the Cobb's angle. So you can see that if you have a Cobb's angle about 30 degrees, it's a significant amount of deformity, right? So people who have, for example, a Cobb's angle of 20 to 29 degrees, so about similar to what you see on the radiograph here, if you're about 10 to 12 years old when you have this degree of deformity, you have about a 60% chance that your curvature will get worse over the next years. However, if you have a curvature which is greater than this, for example, the x-ray on the right-hand side, uh, if, you, if that curvature is over 40 degrees, then regardless of what age you are, even if you're 16, 15 years old, there's a 100% chance or a certainty that your curvature will get worse, okay? So because of that sort of very, um, yeah, progressive natural history that uh, is very difficult for the patient, uh, basically the treatment for AIS, it's not to cure, but it's actually to stop that progression. So the less curvature you have, of course, the better off for your patient. So how do we do that today? Well, it's about the same way that it was done in the time of Hippocrates. Uh, one is non-operative uh, techniques called bracing. So you can see a typical brace. This is called the Boston brace that uh, a patient would have to wear. So you can imagine that even if you wore this brace, and you have to wear this brace uh, either eight hours during the day or eight hours when you sleep. And if you have to wear it during the day, you can imagine that even if you put it underneath your clothes, or sometimes in the summertime you have to wear it on the outside of your clothes, that it's a huge psychological burden. It makes you stand out from all of your peers. Uh, we also have to monitor the progression of the disease, and that's between 10 to 18 years old. So you can imagine how many x-rays or CT scans we have to expose these patients to and the ionizing radiation that can cause problems, especially in young girls. And then there's variable effectiveness. Uh, the earlier you get the brace, the more you wear the brace conscientiously, the better off is your actual um, sort of treatment efficacy. However, of course, we know that the brace is not something everybody wants to wear, and oftentimes patients and even uh, parents of patients will not really stick to the um, treatment plan. The other choice is, of course, if you have a, a curvature which is greater than 45 degrees, Cobb angle greater than 45 degrees, we have to stop the progression somehow. So the only way to do that is to do surgery. Um, and you can see sort of two patients, the upper one and the lower one, uh, which have had uh, a surgery for their scoliosis. Uh, you usually have to put in a lot of metal uh, into these patients, and you have to usually fuse several levels of vertebra. So it's highly in in invasive, and also if you have this instrumentation in, your spine will stop growing, right, of where the instrumentation is. Um, it doesn't actually fully correct the deformity, it's basically there to restore balance to your body so that you can do the normal things that you're supposed to do, stand up straight, sit in a chair, et cetera. Uh, and also, people who have this surgery, they don't avoid complications later on in life when they are adults. They usually have some sort of a problem with their spine. So the treatments are high, well, let's say far from ideal, and they're not curative. <clears throat> 
So why am I interested in what actually causes uh, AIS rather than actually trying to come up with a treatment for it? Well, we think that um, if you know the cause for it, you can actually have rational approaches to both uh, sort of prevention and treatment. So for example, you may figure out ways to detect it more early on. Uh, you may be able to figure out which patients are gonna progress and which patients are not, right? Uh, for those patients who you know will pr progress, you can actually have very aggressive early treatments for them and maybe save them a lot of um, uh, trauma. And uh, you can also try to come up with curative solutions. So we think it's very important to know what causes it, but the trick is to know what. So I tell you a little bit about the theories that people have uh, about what causes AIS. So about 20 years ago, most people believed that the scoliosis was actually caused by a deformation inside your vertebra. So normally, the end plates of your vertebra are parallel. And with scoliosis, they become wedged, which is what you see with those vertebra on the far right in the cartoon, right? And it was thought that the wedging of these vertebra is what causes scoliosis. And there was these guys, uh, Heuter and Folkman, who came up with the law. So if you come up with a law, you can always name it after yourself. Uh, <laughs> and they called this the, the vicious circle. And what they said is, okay, if you have a very slight wedging of your vertebra, which may be bound to happen just because our vertebra don't necessarily always grow symmetrically, right? That that would then create a little bit of a spinal curvature. Uh, then that spine, little bit of spinal curvature will create an asymmetric loading across your growth plates. Uh, that would then create asymmetric growth, which would then create more wedging of your vertebra. So now you have a positive feedback loop, and it just gets worse and worse, and that would, what, would be what explains the progression of the disease, okay? Which seemed to make sense, and that's what sort of what everybody prescribed to. But then, something interesting happened about 15 years ago. People started to realize that the deformity doesn't lie exactly just in the vertebra, but it also lies in the intervertebral disc, which is that soft tissue found between your vertebral bodies. Uh, and you've had talks earlier in the week, uh, so I don't have to explain what the intervertebral disc is, but it's a particular interest of mine, and that's why I started this research in scoliosis. So if you look at the figure on the right, the bottom x-axis is the skeletal age, and the uh, y-axis is the angle of the deformity either in the vertebra or in the disc. And what you see is, uh, uh, let's see if I can use the pointer. So at this point in time, uh, I can get the pointer to work. So at this point in time, basically initially, the disc starts to wedge. And then later on, at this point in time down here is when the vertebra starts to wedge, right? So it happens, sequ it happens in a sequential fashion, and the disc is the first one. And because it happens sequentially, you get sort of a progression in your deformity and the Cobb's angle basically increases with skeletal age. So this started off, the idea is that perhaps the deformity in the disc is where the disease starts. And that was done in a very small cohort of uh, patients. And so we did studies in Utrecht where we looked at larger number of patients, in 77 patients, and here we did CT scans. The earlier study was just done with plain x-rays. So now we could actually measure the deformity, whether it was a rotation of the disc, whether it was a wedging, uh, both uh, inflection and extension, or whether it was a wedging from side to side. And what we found out is that actually the, uh, the wedging that you see, uh, both in rotation and in flexion extension, is actually three times more in the intervertebral disc than in the vertebra and that it correlates directly with the initial Cobb angle deformity that you found in the spine. So again, it strengthens the idea that everything is starting in the disc, and it has to do with both the rotation and the idea that the front of your spine is actually getting a little bit longer than the back of your spine, okay? So then we started with all that information, and of course, like any scientist, you have to come up with a hypothesis of what you think your etiology is so you can actually investigate it. So my sparring partner is a guy named Rene Kostelein, who is a deformity spine surgeon. 
And over five years or so, we discussed all different kinds of hypotheses of what actually could cause the AIS, and we came up with sort of a multifactorial hypothesis, uh, which is based upon those observations that I just told you about. Uh, we thought that it was a combination of biomechanics and functional anatomy and mechanobiological events that when they're all brought together in one individual's spine at the right timing, right, uh, so especially females during the time that they're growing, that that conspires to create this progressive deformity that we call AIS. And so the idea is that because it's multifactorial and it all happens, needs to happen more or less at the same time in a sequential fashion, that we basically call this our, our perfect storm for AIS. And that's how the name that we came up with is Scoli Storm for this project, right? So just keep uh, in, in your memory the perfect storm. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about uh, some of the unique things about scoliosis or AIS. So AIS only occurs in humans. It occurs in no other animal. So that made us start to think, okay, what is actually unique about humans that's not true of, for example, even uh, non-human primates, okay? And one of the things is, uh, and also I remember I told you that AIS has this huge rotational component. So everybody thought that it's just a lateral curvature, but there's actually a huge rotational component. So we thought, okay, one of the things that makes humans unique is, of course, our ability to stand completely upright. So if you look at, for example, our nearest, uh, let's say, uh, relatives and species, the chimpanzee or the gorilla, they also can stand upright, but they also spend quite a lot of time actually moving on all four limbs, okay? And what it does to the spine is what you see on the right-hand side. A chimpanzee or a gorilla has what we call a kaphotic spine. So it actually spine curves forward. The human spine is an S-shaped curve, and there is a kyphosis in the thoracic region that makes us bend forward, but there's also what we call lordosis in the lower back, which makes us bend backwards, okay? And we're the only species of animal that has a lordosis in our spines, okay? So what does that lordosis actually mean? So if you think about it, if you have a lordosis, there are vertebra in our spines which are tilting forward. Those are the ones in green. And there are vertebra in our spines that are tilting backwards, okay? So now, uh, I don't know if I can use my pointer. Uh, so in these sort of, between the, the vertebral bodies, this would be where our intervertebral discs is, but in behind the vertebral bodies or behind the spinal cord, we also have another joint in our spines which are called the facet joints. And the facet joints interlock so that the top one is posterior and then the, anter the bottom one is anterior. So what happens is that uh, when the spines are tilted forward, basically the cranial one will slide anteriorly and the facet joints will lock, right? But if they're tilted backwards and this one slides back, or retrolisthesis we call it, then actually the facet joints will unlock. Oops, sorry. And when they unlock, basically the, the vertebral body can actually rotate. The vertebra can entirely rotate. Okay, so because of this functional anatomy that we have, if you have a retro-tilted vertebra, they will unlock. So that's kind of like having, we always think of these vertebra as being like blocks that are, are, are on top of each other. So I don't know if you've ever played the game uh, Yenga or Jenga, but that's like, you know, taking blocks out, everything becomes unstable. So now, the other thing is, what happens when these uh, vertebra are allowed to rotate? Well, if you have a little bit of rotation, uh, basically the center of rotation indicated by that little black dot is about the center of your discs. But if you have a little bit more rotation with a little bit more load, the center of rotation actually moves backwards, okay? And if you have even more load, the center of rotation basically moves to the facet joint. So what's happening is that that facet joint will lock and then everything rotates around the facet joint, okay? So that means your center of rotation is now behind your disc. So if you have a rotation and you think about the strains inside of the annulus, which is around the outside of the disc, 
That means the strains in the anterior part of your annulus will be much bigger than the strains in the posterior part of your annulus, right? And if those strains were to exceed sort of the limit of your plasticity or they would become in failure, that means that you would stretch out the anterior part of your annulus. And because of your collagen fibers being oriented about 30 degrees relative to your end plate, you would stretch out your collagen fibers or you, you would cause them to slide relative to each other. And then when the load is taken off and it goes back to its neutral position, what you'll see is that the anterior part of your annulus has now elongated, but the posterior part not. So that means you can, by rotating your vertebra, you can create this anterior-posterior wedging. Okay? So that's where we think the wedging might be coming from. So why girls? Okay? That's another important thing about AIS. I think there is a, uh, it's, I think, eight or nine times more prevalent in girls than in boys. So as you all know, uh, girls actually hit their peak growth spurt earlier than boys, right? And they hit their growth spurt somewhere, I think if you look at this curves, around age 13. That's on average. But if you look at skeletal maturity, one of the things that determines skeletal maturity is you all know about growth plates and that you become skeletally mature when your growth plates close. And you have lots of growth plates. Everywhere where you have bone, you have growth plates but they don't all close at the same time. Some growth plates close earlier than others, and the girls' growth spurts, when they're 13 years old, their growth, some of their growth plates are open and some are closed. Boys, their peak growth is somewhere more closer to the age of about 16 years old, and at that time, most of the growth plates have already started to close, so they have matured. So girls are actually increasing their body mass, their musculature, before their growth plates all close, right? So that could mean, for example, that with increased body mass, you have increased musculature, you also have increased loading on your discs. Also, remember the, the backward tilting vertebra? Well, it also turns out that your spine also grows during this growth spurt, and girls, which are the spines always on the left, even before their growth spurt, at their peak growth spurt, and after their growth spurts, they have actually more retro-tilting vertebra in their spine than boys, okay? This is probably coming from the fact that as girls develop, they develop breasts, which then actually they have to counterbalance with their spinal curvature, okay? So now that's about the functional anatomy. There's some biomechanics. So what about the mechanobiology part? Where does that come in? So as you know, all of our bones, they grow with these growth plates. So this is a picture here of your uh, long bones. So this is the end of your bone, this is articular cartilage, and this is your growth plate. And you have two of those growth plates, one proximal and one distal. And the idea is that it's a misnomer that the growth plate actually grows. It does grow, but immediately turns into bone. So first it makes more cartilage, the cartilage calcifies, and then turns into bone. And then basically this keeps going on and on until they close. So in almost all animals, okay, you have a growth plate that looks like this inside your vertebra. So this is the intervertebral disc, this is your nucleus, this is your annulus, this is the cranial vertebra, and this is the caudal vertebra. And this sort of uh, cartilaginous line here, this is your growth plate. So each vertebra, you have a cranial and a caudal growth plate. That is, except for if you happen to be human, okay? If you're a human, there's something different going on. You have, so when you have a growth plate like this, uh, like here with bone on one side and bone on the other side, we call this a physis, and you have an epiphyseal growth plate. Uh, in humans, we have something called an apophyseal growth plate. So here we have vertebra, and you have a layer of cartilage on top of the vertebra between your vertebra and your disc, and same thing on the other side. And this is the growth plate that grows and grows and grows. And then when your growth plate closes, you get this ring of ossification that's at first separate, and then later on it fuses with your vertebra, and we call this the apophyseal ring. And what happens to that growth plate cartilage? Well, it actually quiets down at some point and becomes hyaline cartilage, just like your articular cartilage, okay? And this we call the cartilaginous end plate. So, why is this important? Well, 
if you look at growth plates, there this really well studied from molecular biologists. There is a lot of growth factors, and all of these growth factors are spatially and temporally regulated to actually tell the chondrocytes to proliferate, to tell them to hypertrophy, to tell them to calcify. Right? And because now the growth plate is actually sitting next to the disc, we think that a lot of these growth factors could affect what happens inside of your disc, inside of your annulus fibrosis. Right? So, and it's been shown, for example, things like IGF, TGF, PDGF, uh, Indian hedgehog protein, uh, PDGRF, these things all have an effect on the annulus fibrosis cells. And if you actually start looking at those wedge discs and you compare what happens from the concave to the convex side, you start to see differences in collagen architecture. You start to see differences in elastin architecture. Uh, you also start to see uh, differences in the enzymes that affect the collagen architecture uh, and the GAGs, like the MMPs. Okay? So the hypothesis here is that growth plate growth factors or growth plate morphogens because of the, uh, of the adjacency to the disc can affect the growing disc. Okay, So this is basically uh, Rene and my uh, hypothesis about what causes uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So what we say is that from the functional anatomy side in humans, you have this lordosis. And because of the biomechanics, you can actually cause a sort of retrolisthesis and a rotation of your vertebra. Because you're growing, that rotation is going to get worse and worse with higher loads. Uh, and if you happen to grow faster than your tissue can mature, you may exceed the strength of the tissue, and you might create plastic deformations in your tissue. Also, because of the mechanobiology, you have these morphogens around. It could actually make those plastic deformations more, or it could accentuate the remodeling and make them permanent. And putting all of those mechanobiology, functional anatomy, and biomechanics together, you get this perfect storm that leads you to AIS. Okay? So that's our hypotheses. And uh, yeah, we actually published this. And people said, well, that's a very nice hypothesis. Good luck with it. You know, and that was the end of the story. Um, and we tried to get financing for it for many, many years. And basically, it was such a rare disease. And people just said, well, you know, you better, better spend the money on actually trying to create treatments for it. Uh, so finally, we actually went to the ERC. Uh, and this is basically the focus of my ERC uh, advance grant, because there they don't really care about whether it's useful or not. They just care about whether it's interesting. Um, so there are some challenging uh, challenges in trying to actually work out that hypothesis and to explore it. Uh, the first challenging part is that, of course, AIS only happens in humans. So there's no surrogate model to study the disease. You cannot actually have an animal that develops AIS. If you try to, develop scoli if you try to create scoliosis in an animal, it's not AIS. So you can't study its etiology, right? Um, we're trying to study etiology and mechanisms, so that means we need data actually before the disease happens. So if you see someone with scoliosis, that's too late. So we actually have to treat patients, we actually have to look at subjects before they become patients, right? And we also have to do it during adolescence. So what crazy parent is going to let you actually do experiments on their child, right? Or what child is going to actually allow you to do experiments on them? Um, and then finally, we want to study spinal stability, which means we have to study uh, stresses and strains inside the tissue. Uh, and no one is going to let us uh, you know, measure those things in vivo. So for all of these reasons, it was kind of a puzzle to us how we could proceed. But we came up with a method uh, which involves in silico uh, work. Uh, so I'll explain to you how that works. But basically, you see that the, the project is divided into four work packages. One has to do with longitudinal uh, monitoring of the growth. Another part has to do with looking at spinal instability and looking at the strains inside the disc. Uh, work package two has to do with looking at the tissue and seeing how strong the tissue is and how it changes with growth. And then the last part is looking at the growth plate morphogens and looking at the effect of these morphogens on the growing uh, or remodeling annulus fibrosis.
So I'll explain a little bit to you what we do. It may be interesting for some of you who use uh, other techniques just than in silico modeling. But the first thing we had to do is to figure out how can we get around the ionizing radiation problem. You know, if we want to actually monitor the spine growth, we have to basically monitor it at least once a year. So that means that we would have to take five images of any subject over their adolescent period. And that's a lot of radiation. So we actually came up with a method to do that, which is called bone MRI. And the challenge here is to actually do bone MRI of the thoracic and lumbar spine. It's already been used for places like the hip or the proximal humerus. But basically, it is a technique of using a, a multi-echo sequencing and trying to actually use deep learning to create something which is similar to a synthetic CT. That's what they call it. So you see the image A. That is basically uh, an image uh, of the, one of the sequences that we take on our MRI machine. Then you can see what the deep learning does to create the synthetic uh, CT in panel B. And then you can, of course, segment it and make a sort of a 3D uh, reconstruction of the spine, uh, spinal bone segments. And then you can compare that to a, a normal CT, a clinical CT shown on panel C. Okay? So it actually works fairly well, but there are some bugs that we have to figure out for how to apply it to the thoracic and lumbar spine. So now that we have, if we have that, then what we need to do is we also need to combine that bone MRI with a normal MRI sequences that are used for evaluating the disc. Because that's where we think everything starts, so we need to image not only the bony parts of the spine, but also the disc. And, and the other thing is that we have to do this in adolescence, and we have to do it within one MRI session, which is 20 minutes. And that's the challenge. You can put someone in MRI, if you can put them in for a whole day, you can do whatever you want, but we only have 20 minutes, and that's the challenge. So then, of course, we have to track the longitudinal growth, so we need to track functional anatomy uh, during adolescence. Uh, we need to capture the peak growth before and after the onset of scoliosis, but if you only have 2 to 3 percent of your population to develop scoliosis, you would have to have thousands of patients right, to have some of your subjects who unfortunately will develop scoliosis during your study. And that's not feasible from a cost standpoint or from a resource standpoint. But luckily, we have access to sort of two groups of, or two cohorts. One are patients who have a micro deletion uh, in genetic mutation, which is called a 22Q11-2 uh, micro deletion. Uh, these patients can have uh, there are the people who have this microdeletion syndrome can have uh, very severe um, abnormalities or very light abnormalities. In fact, there's many, many people with this microdeletion syndrome walking around that don't even know it. Uh, but they have, if you're female and you're a child, you have about a 50% chance of developing scoliosis. So that gives us actually a good patient population to work with. Uh, and luckily, the one of the um, institutions that I work at, which is the Utrecht Medical Center, is actually the Dutch center for these uh, micro deletion sequence patients. So we have access to that cohort. The other cohort is actually uh, younger siblings or younger daughters of patients who have had AIS. They also have a, a higher percentage, about 7 to 8 percent chance of getting scoliosis. So, of course, if we follow those patients, then we also might get some subjects who develop scoliosis uh, during our study. And then we'll do things like tracking MRI, body growth parameters, et cetera, et cetera. So now what about the tissue properties? Well, we need to figure out how to measure tissue properties. We can't do it on our clinical study patients, uh, right? So there what we, want, what we need to do is we need to go to the tissue banks around the world. Uh, we need to collect specimens uh, from adolescent discs. And these are very, very difficult to find. But luckily, I have a large network of spine surgeons who are friends. And through those contacts, we'll, we think that we'll be able to collect enough specimens that we can measure the structure of these annulus fibroses. We can measure uh, their mechanical properties and their composition. And that we can do it over the, all the ages from 10 to basically 17 or so. And then finally, the part that is the most interesting, I think, to you guys is the fact that we can't study the biomechanics in these patients. Nevertheless, uh, for example, when we do MRI, all of these patients are not standing. 
So we can't measure how their vertebra line up in posture. They're lying supine on a table, right? So all we can get is sort of the, the way in which their vertebra are shaped or their discs are shaped, but we can't even figure out what they would be like in, in when standing upright. So in order to answer questions like, are adolescent spines stable under physiological loading just when they're standing, we need a model for that. Uh, if we want to know if instability leads to AF tissue overloading, we need a model for that. Uh, if we want to know if it's different between those people who develop scoliosis or not, we need a model for that. And if we want to know how it changes with growth, we need a model for that. Uh, so therefore, we decided to do this sequential uh, subject-specific FE models, uh, which are based on that clinical study information that we get with the bone MRI and the disc MRI, and we do a biomechanical in silico analysis, and I'll come back to that. And then finally, to look at the growth plate morphogens, what we're planning on doing is, uh, is using uh, cells, uh, tissue models, uh, motion segment models, and looking at how uh, cells from mice as well as cells from humans react to these morphogens. But that's not really the focus of this uh, talk. So let's go back to the in silico models. Um, so actually, uh, one of the reasons why Jerome and I know each other, and actually you might see uh, Aaron, I think who uh, Aaron talked to you, I guess on Monday it was, so we know each other because we were involved in a European uh, study a while ago, which was called My Spine. It was uh, led by uh, Damien Lacroix when he was here in Barcelona. And uh, the idea there was that we wanted to make uh, spatient-specific mechanobiology finite element models of the lumbar spine. And the whole point about that study was to actually look at what happens to the segment next to a fusion because it was believed that if you do a fusion in your spine, you will elicit degeneration of the segment next to it, right? But in that study, we built these patient-specific models, and that was sort of our starting point. So let me explain to you how those models work. Uh, so those models are multi-scale, and we're not talking multi-scale like the range that uh, Ilsa was talking about, but it's a very narrow range, and it only has to do with models that actually model the lumbar spine and models that model just one motion segment, so two vertebra and the disc in between. We also had to include mechanobiology, so we included, for example, the mechanoregulation, uh, let's see, theories. Uh, so for the disc, we used the uh, tissue differentiation theory of Prendergast that determines whether the cell behaves like an osteoblast, behaves like a chondrocyte, or behaves like a fibroblast. So that was for mechanobiology of the disc. And then for mechanobiology of the vertebra, we use basically the strain energy density theory that was proposed by Rakowskis many years ago. So we put that together, and basically what we did is on the left-hand side, you see sort of what the lumbar spine model looked like. Uh, you see a contour plot of the density of the trabecular bone in a mid-sagittal slice. So that means that the more darker blue it is, the less dense the bone, and the more greenish, yellow, red, the more dense the bone. So what we did is we started off with creating a patient-specific lumbar model. And basically, we removed uh, one of the discs and fused the two vertebra together. And then now what we focus on is the vertebra above the fusion, the disc above that fusion, and of course, the next vertebra cranial to that. And what we do is, from the lumbar model, we take the forces obtained and we apply it to the spinal motion segment model. And of course, we want to make this patient specific, and we have to include the mechanobiology. So the mechanobiology theories have a lot of parameters that need to be sort of, you need to create values for them, and you have to make that patient specific because it changes from patient to patient. So what we do is we take the bone density at the time of operation, and we basically fit those parameter values so that we get the right bone density distribution in those two vertebra. Okay. And then what we can do is we can basically run the model for the time period uh, that we have the follow-up, and we can figure out what happens to the disc and what happens to the bone volume changes inside those two vertebra. So uh, on the left-hand side, what you see on the top row is the pre-surgery bone density distribution. The middle row is the two-year post-surgery predicted by the simulation, 
And then the bottom row is the two-year post-surgery that was actually measured on these patients. And you see uh, the columns are actually three different patients. Uh, so sometimes you see that the prediction of the model uh, for the bone density it actually matches quite well what was clinically measured. In some patients, you see it uh, very well, and in some patients, it's a bit less well. Right? And then you can also do the same thing with the disc to see what happens to disc over two years of time. But that's not the strength of the model. The strength of the model is what happens at the five-year and the 10-year period when you would expect some of these changes to occur. So here what you can see is for one particular patient, you can see the pre-surgery uh, distribution uh, of bone in that third column. Uh, then you can see two years post-surgery what it predicts. And then on the far right is what the clinical scan shows. And you can see the bone density is actually pretty good there. But then you can see five years and 10 years after surgery, how would the bone density change? And it changes slightly, but not a lot. But interestingly, if you look at the disc, for example, you can see that from pre-surgery to post-surgery, the nucleus is actually not changing that much in volume. So the area where you have a lot of collagen, which is in the annulus, is not changing. And the area which you have a lot of gags, which is the second column to the left, you see there is also not changing. But if you go down to five years and 10 years, you see that the nucleus is actually shrinking. The area where you have a lot of gags is actually shrinking, and the area where you have collagen is actually growing which is indicating that the disc is actually degenerating. And that is what's often found when you do fusion surgery, that in some patients you have accelerated degeneration of the adjacent disc, which is the main problem. So how does that help us to actually, well, do what we want to do in Scoli Storm? So from that knowledge, we actually are now moving forward and trying to now do this for Scoli Storm. And this is sort of the algorithm that we are developing as we speak, or at least I'm not, but my postdoc and PhD students are. Um, but this is what we came up with. So we want to start off with a very generic sort of torso model of an adolescent person. And then what we want to do is we want to transform that based on the MRI, bone MRI scans that we do. And we're mostly interested in the spinal curvature and the thoracic volume. OK, or thoracic size. Then we want to replace each of those vertebra with a subject-specific segmented vertebra from the bone MRI. And we'll use a statistical shape modeling to do that. And then we also need to basically come up with a patient-specific uh, IVD model. And we'll do that using segmentation uh, for machine learning. And I'll explain a little bit of these uh, in the next slides. And then finally, that will allow us to come back to a full-scale finite element model, which is subject specific. And then we can use the detailed spinal units of interest to look at, for example, what happens to the apical segment, which is a segment which has the most amount of bending or deformity, which is usually where the deformity starts, right? So now, since the field of view of these bone scans or bone MRI scans, it doesn't really contain the complete horse torso. We need to focus down sort of to the spine. So it's actually hard for us to start. So it's hard for us to actually create a complete torso model of the patient directly, and that's why we start with this generic torso model. So based on the bone MRI scans, we basically adjust the size and the curvature of the spine, and then we take the uh, sort of axial or transverse views of the torso on T2 weighted images, and we fit basically the rib cage. And we scale that independently so that now we get the size of the thoracic volume, right? That's not too difficult. So then the next part is we need a set of manual segmentations to create the statistical shape model of each vertebra. But once we have that, then we can now go to automated uh, ways of doing the segmentation in a very rough way which is possible. And then moving through most of the modes of the variation, we can use the statistical shape model to generate an accurate subject-specific mesh for each vertebra. And I don't think this is that unconventional to the, some of the things that you may be working on. But the added benefit of this methodology for us is that if you use these statistical shape models, we can actually quantify how much each vertebra of these subjects deviate from the population average. And that way, it'll help us to see if there's anything unusual going on in those patients who develop scoliosis and those patients who don't. 
So then the IVDs, they will be segmented independent of the vertebra because we do them actually on a different sequence uh, from the MRI. Uh, the IVDs, are, they have a much simpler geometry than the vertebra, right? And so we can use machine learning to do the automatic segmentation. Uh, the machine learning network uses the same input algorithms as those used to generate the bone MRI scans. And the challenge uh, from uh, the MICC AI, which is a society that looks at uh, image computing uh, and uh, computer-assisted interventions, they actually came up with a challenge. And uh, these groups, they, they responded to the challenge, and they came up with some very promising results of how they can do this machine learning segmentation. And here, the slide just shows that a network uh, which scored the highest in this segmentation accuracy and basically, we'll just be adopting those methodologies. So now in the end, basically, this will give us a full-scale torso model of the subject-specific spinal curvature, the rib cage, the vertebra, and all the discs in the thoracic and lumbar region. And we want to reduce the computational costs. So basically, that full torso model will be very simplistic. Uh, it will become uh, mostly isotropic, linear material properties. Uh, but now if we go down to the segment model, there we can actually make it quite complex. We can use for the discs, for example, we can use osmo, poro, visco, elastic, fiber reinforced models to model the annulus and the fibrosis. We can use uh, orthotropic uh, bone models or we can use uh, bone models where we, tend to, we have the spatial distribution of the bone density, uh, which is directly correlated to the stiffness. So that gives us something that we think we will be able to measure the biomechanics inside those motion segments. But there's actually many hurdles that we still have to overcome. We just started, so I, I can't really show you too many results, but we already know many of the hurdles that we're gonna have to meet. Um, for example, I told you the clinical study. There's two cohorts, there's 60 patients in each cohort, or 60 subjects in each cohort. That's 120 subjects. We're gonna scan them five times throughout their growing lives. Uh, that's, uh, that's like over 500 scans, right? So if you don't have automation, it's impossible to create a spatial-specific model for each one of their time points. Uh, we also don't know what's the level of complexity that we need uh, because we don't know actually what causes the scoliosis. So, for example, we could be missing something like the muscles, which could be very important uh, for the scoliosis. Uh, we also don't know what model predictions are relevant. Uh, is it the overall stressor strain? Is it the local stressor strain? Are these tissues affine or non-affine? What about the interfaces between the soft tissue and the hard tissue? Uh, how are those going to be important? And then finally, we have some methodology issues that we have to overcome. Uh, so of course, our cohorts are gonna be prepubescent volunteers. There'll be initial scans will happen at nine years of age. But so far, we've been developing all of our methodologies on basically young adults. And we don't know if all of these methodologies will actually work for these very pubescent uh, children. Uh, the bone MRI scans, uh, we know they work for things like the proximal hip, but we don't know if they're going to work for the thoracic and uh, the lumbar spine. And then finally, yeah, much was said about in silico methods and validation. The, the difficulty is how are we going to validate uh, this whole process of creating these patient-specific uh, spine models. We have some ideas, but uh, it's going to be challenging. So I hope I was able to tell you a little bit about AIS, uh, that you learned what it is, uh, that you uh, see that our hypothesis is sort of this perfect storm that is very multifactorial, and that you can see the sort of the power of using these uh, in silico methods to not only do detection and diagnosis of disease, but also to understand things that we just cannot measure today. So these are my collaborators, both in Eindhoven and in Utrecht, and of course the ERC for providing the funding for this work. So be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hello. Oh, no. So thank you so much for such an interesting and amazing talk. Are there questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Kate. It's a very great uh, presentation.
Um, you said uh, animal models. There are none for scoliosis. What do you think of... Um, there was a... I mean, there's a group that thinks fish, like uh, zebrafish, as a good model for scoliosis. And there was a publication, actually, in Science in 2016, and they said that... Uh, there is some evidence that in the fluid flow of um, the cerebral column that there is maybe uh, some mutation, at least from the fish species, that um, there is a, story, a, a distor distortion of this fluid flow that could be responsible for scoliosis, at least in the fish model. Yeah, so um, so, what I, uh, so I should correct myself if I spoke wrongly, that there is no animal model for adil adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So there are animal models for other kinds of scoliosis. And the zebrafish model is believed to be a, a form of more neurodegenerative scoliosis because it has a lot to do with uh, the musculature. And if you, like, knock out muscles or you give different growth factors, you can change the scoliosis that the fish get. And the scoliosis actually doesn't happen during the peak growth spurt of those fish. Okay, thanks. No. Thanks, Keita, for the um, very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering if your um, model would uh, integrate the bone density uh, of those uh, of the patients, and do you have any plan for having a, a subject-specific uh, bone density for those patients? And if not, if this would be a limitation for for the in silico simulations. So at at the beginning, we were very much focused on the disc. So if you look at the relative stiffness of the vertebra and the discs, the vertebra are so much stiffer that you could almost imagine that you could treat them as rigid bodies, right? And that it was more the shape of the vertebra which was important. But we also realized that, well, we could also be wrong. And it could be that the scoliosis begins in the vertebra. So we have to leave that option open that if we're going to put all this effort into making the patient-specific models, we also want to make patient-specific models for the vertebra. And interestingly, the uh, synthetic CT that comes from the bone MRI gives you a density distribution, which is actually directly correlated to Hounsfield's units from a clinical CT scanner. So we know the relationship between those Hounsfield's units and bone stiffness. So we can also, from the synthetic CT, create models where you have a density of bone distribution or bone mass distribution inside the vertebra. Okay. So we're planning also on incorporating that, but not we can't do it at the full spine model because it's just computationally expensive, but we can do it at the segment model. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, hi. Oh, there you are, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm short enough, you can't see me that easy. Oh, me, oh, me too, so. <laughs> okay, so my question was that based on your experience, have you seen like those patients which are having this AIS that because of this altered posturing, they develop foot deformities also. Like, uh, for example, the patients with spina bifida. So in those subjects, uh, you you have seen that they, are, they do develop club foot. So these subjects, they have this altered, uh, like, foot mechanics also or no? No, interestingly enough, these uh, patients are most of them, let's say 90 to 80 percent of the patients who have AIS, have no other uh, abnormalities. They're, they're really completely healthy children. Uh, there is a hereditary component to it that we know of, but they really uh, exhibit no abnormalities whatsoever. And uh, so we thought, you know, there must be like ligament laxity, uh, spinal, well, muscular issues and stuff. But as far as everybody has investigated so far, um, there is really, in these AIS patients, they don't exhibit any other abnormalities. It's very interesting. Okay, so are there any studies in which we can see, like, how is their gait affected? Uh, yes, so the difficulty is, again, no one has actually investigated the gait of adolescents before they develop scoliosis, because that's one of the challenges. Um, they have looked at the people who have uh, developed scoliosis, and their gait does change, and the, their gait changes correlate directly to the severity of their deformity. So it's really thought that the gait abnormalities happen because of the deformity and not vice versa. But it could be that, for example, there could be gait differences, uh, which then you could use as a biomarker for determining who might get scoliosis, and then you could try to prevent it. All right. Thank you. <laughs>
Hi, Kate. A fantastic uh, presentation. Forgive me, I had to step out for five minutes, so my question may be redundant. You may, you may tell me you've already answered it or mentioned it. It was just on that biomarkers uh, conversation. Uh, the first thing I was going to ask is, uh, is there any permanent or temporal uh, disability, you know, paralysis, as a result of scoliosis, you know, because I'm thinking of the load on the spinal cord, you know, the spinal cord as well, you know, that, especially when it's very pronounced scoliosis. Yeah, interestingly enough, there is not. So yeah. th there is uh, no neurological symptoms in right. these patients who have AIS. Uh, it seems that they're, um, uh, if they have deformity of the posterior elements of the vertebra, that yeah. those uh, deformities happen in such a way that the spinal canal remains open and the foramen between the vertebra always remain open so yeah. that they don't get any kind of nervous symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Just just on the, the biomarker, and forgive me if I'm hogging all the question and answer time, but the, I was listening to a podcast with, with Carl Dieseroth a while back, and he was talking about optoelectronics being used to map brain signals. And I wondered if there's like a pattern to people who, who are having to adjust, you know, for having scoliosis, you know, if there's, if there's typical you know, sort of motor signals uh, for, for that. So the, one of the other theories uh, is that it's not just an increase uh, in the musculature and body mass that creates this uh, sort of asymmetric loading, but that, that it could be actually uh, muscular in origin. Yeah. Uh, and so people have tried to measure uh, EMG signals uh, peripherally, yeah. uh, but they have not been able to find any differences like that. Yeah. But of course, it could happen centrally. Uh, but I would assume that if it happens centrally, you would be able to detect it peripherally. Yeah. 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 But so far, people have not been able to find uh, any correlations there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, forgive me for asking a third <laughs> question. I will put the mic down eventually. It's just, again, I'm not biomarkers. And, uh, well, maybe it's not biomarkers. It's probably, you know, a proxy measurement. But I was thinking about motion capture in between the x-rays to try and reduce the x-rays is maybe, you know, motion capture is another you know, potential way of, of kind of seeing if there's a difference, you know, periodically, you know, if, if, that, if that's another way of doing it. There could be a, that could be a very interesting way of doing it because then we can see, for example, postural control of these uh, patients and we can also perturb them. So we can ask them to add, stand on a plate where you, it's a little bit unstable or that you perturb, and then you can see their reaction. Yeah. So we did think about that, but unfortunately, in my two institutions, we don't have access to a gate lab. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of the practical reason why we decided not to do it. Thank you. But it could be very fruitful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. particularly if that whole three-dimensional aspect. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Thank you. Well, hello. Uh, here. Yes. Well, very nice presentation. Uh, well, I have a question about the the meshes, about the process to obtain it. Well, um, did you perform a morph process with the template that you have, or all the patient-specific models have different meshes? So yeah, it's a kind of a mesh morphing technique, uh, like you can imagine, you s because we want to keep the meshes as uniform as possible. So we start off with a standard mesh, and then we use these statistical shape models, a tongue twister, uh, to actually morph the standard mesh to the patient-specific geometry uh, for each one of the vertebrae separately. Uh, and so far, that, that technique seems to work well, as others have also shown, for the normal um, vertebra. Uh, but it's a bit tricky because the vertebral bodies don't change that much. But the posterior elements are very irregular in shape, uh, and that has some difficulties there. And we're thinking, OK, maybe it works for healthy uh, vertebra. But of course, as the vertebra become more deformed, it's going to be even more difficult to do. Um, so we think that is going to be a big challenge for us going forward. And how do you do with the cartilage template? Because so we don't model the cartilage on plate. So we just kind of ignore it, uh, not because it's not important, uh, but because we can't model it so well. Uh, but we also know that the cartilage on plate, in terms of the biomechanics of the disc, doesn't play a big role. So the stresses and strains created inside the nucleus and the annulus, uh, how they deform, the cartilage on plate doesn't play a big role. It plays a big role in nutrition and solute yeah. transport, but we're not studying that here. So, Okay, thank you. Sure. I think I think that's you already gave a great example, Keita. Thank you very much for that.
uh, of uh, how computational modeling and all the years of experiences in computational modeling and reasoning and mechanisms so leads you then to this uh, hypothesis of, of perfect storm. So beyond all the application that Emmanuel uh, has presented this morning in terms of uh, technology transfer, uh, there is also a very important part of modeling in the development of research per se. So that's, that's fantastic, thanks. Yep, thank you. Thanks for your attention.